Guns. Welcome back to Anti-War Radio Chaos 92.7 FM in Austin, Texas. I'm Scott Horton. We're streaming live from chaosradioaustin.org and antiwar.com slash radio. And introducing our guest today, it's Pat Buchanan. He's an analyst for NBC News, MSNBC, former Nixon speechwriter and author of Where the Right Went Wrong, Day of Reckoning, A Republic, Not an Empire, The Death of the West, and the brand new one is Churchill, Hitler, and the Unnecessary War, How Britain Lost Its Empire and the West Lost the World. Welcome back to the show, Pat. Thanks very much, Scott. Delighted to be here. Well, I'm very glad to have you on here, and uh, you're really kind of playing with fire writing a book like this. This is an act of heresy against uh, the founding myth of our state religion. It's no longer George Washington and the American Revolution. It's World War II, and you're trying to uh, rewrite the history. I guess I'm used to hearing some revisionist arguments about America shouldn't have fought World War II, but this book is about how Britain shouldn't have fought World War II, how actually they blundered into World War II. Is that right? Well, I think that's right, but as we're playing with fire, I've had a long career as an arsonist, so I'm not too worried <laughs> about that. But, uh, yeah, the, what the book is about is the series of colossal blunders made by the British statesmen and the British Empire between 1905 and 1939 that led them to declare war twice on Germany, uh, both of which were unnecessary wars that resulted in the collapse of the British Empire, the utter destruction of Germany, and the Stalinization of half of Europe. And uh, I go through a number of episodes and decisions that were taken, each of which I think by many folks at the time and in retrospect were really colossal blunders. And, of course, the major one in World War II was, before World War II, was giving the war guarantee to Poland to go to war on behalf of Poland in a dispute over Danzig, where the British thought, in reality, the Germans were right. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to put off the details of that for a moment here. And, and in the larger sense, you say that future historians will look back at the world wars, and they'll call this the Great Civil War of the West. This was the end of Western hegemony on Earth. Yeah, I think if you take the war of 1914, 1918, then 1939 to 1945, there are really two phases of a gigantic war of Western civilization where all the European empires and monarchies, in effect, went to war against each other, slaughtered each other in enormous numbers, and at the end, Europe was in ruins and all the empires were collapsing. I think historians will see the Second World War, and many already do, as having emerged inexorably out of the First World War and its consequences in the Versailles Treaty. And I think that is an accurate uh, perception. And, of course, at the end of World War II, it was sort of the extra European powers, the Soviet Union and the United States, that dominated the world. Now, uh, let's talk about World War I here. This is actually one of my favorite things to do on Earth, is to blame Woodrow Wilson for everything. Now, obviously, the European politicians created this disaster. If you'd like to uh, talk a little bit about the secret war guarantee to France and, and how that played into it, that's good. But then the consequences of American entry into World War I in direct contravention of the advice of George Washington. Well, I wrote about the American intervention in World War I in a republic, not an empire, uh, on, in that chapter on there on Woodrow Wilson's intervention. This book deals with the beginnings and the origins of World War I, uh, which clearly lay in the alliances, the, the Germans, Italians, versus the and, uh, Austrians versus the Russians and French, and the British coming into the war because of a secret war guarantee and because the Germans crossed over into Belgium on their way into France. But let me talk briefly about Wilson. Wilson had kept the United States out of World War I, and he did so effectively despite the uh, pressure from Theodore Roosevelt to Republicans like Lodge and Roosevelt, and also despite the fact that in his inner core, the four principal individuals who made the decision were basically Wilson, House, Colonel House, Walter Hines Page, the ambassador to Great Britain, and Lansing, the Secretary of State. Now, all three of the latter were much more pro-war than Wilson. He ran on a platform of, he kept us out of war. But the Kaiser stupidly uh, ordered a, uh, or accepted the demands of the German general staff for all-out submarine warfare in Je on February 1, 1917. 
And that gave Wilson the excuse to go into war, which is where he was tending in any event. And so he took us into war that April. And 18 months later, uh, there were 2 million American soldiers in France and 2 million more on the way. And clearly Wilson uh, and the Democrats took us into war, but I would not exonerate Theodore Roosevelt and the Republicans totally. Right, yeah, I know that uh, TR pushed for it for a long time before they finally did. But uh, you cite Jim Powell, actually, in the book, and we've talked to him on the show before. He's the author of Wilson's War, and he explains how the war basically was coming to an end as a stalemate and that because of American intervention, the Russians stayed in the war long enough for Kerensky to be overthrown on Lenin's fourth try to create the Soviet Union. And then, of course, the uh, Versailles Treaty, which we'll have to cover in depth here, but also the breaking of the Ottoman Empire and the turning over of that part of the Middle East to the British and the French to draw the borders that we're dealing with today. Well, that's exactly right. Had the United States stayed out of the war, I think the war would have come to a bloody stalemate in 1917, or maybe the German offensive in 1918 would have prevailed, and Germany would have overrun Paris. There would have been an Allied surrender, as there had been at Brest-Litovsk, by the new regime of Lenin and Stalin and Trotsky. In that event, if the Germans had prevailed in the West and there had been no Versailles Treaty, I think you would have had at least have a great powers there that could have dealt with Lenin and Stalin as they rose basically in power and strength, which would have gone in and hung all the Bolsheviks in St. Petersburg. But what you did when you destroyed Germany, and then this vindictive Versailles Treaty, which tore it apart, you basically amputated the strongest power in Central Europe and the bulwark against Russia, and then you gave it an enormous motivation for revenge. And this is what Adolf Hitler built upon in his rise to power. He gave a speech a thousand times that was titled simply the Treaty of Versailles. And Wilson was responsible for it because he had given the Germans, when they quit the war, these guarantees under the 14 points that those would be the terms of peace, and he allowed them to be trampled all over by the British and French, and he went along with it. And, you know, I think when uh, people talk in America, when we talk about the Treaty of Versailles and what it had to do with the lead-up to World War II, often the focus is on the war reparations and the hyperinflation and the economic circumstances during Hitler's first try, the Beer Hall Putsch, and how that was caused by the Treaty of Versailles. But uh, I think people often neglect the dismemberment of Germany, as you describe it in the book, where in all directions... All the countries neighboring Germany got big pieces of it. Well, exactly. Now, if you take the defeated powers, Austria-Hungary, and you take Germany, now what happened? Germany lost northern Schleswig to Denmark. It lost two small areas, Joypen and Malbody, to Belgium. It lost Alsace-Lorraine to France. Its entire western, the Rhineland, was demilitarized. Austria lost South Tyrol to Italy, which was an Austrian-German enclave there on the other side of the Alps. Hungary was torn to pieces. Uh, part of it, Transylvania given to Romania, which was with the Allies. The Banat region was given to the Serbs. The Hungarian ancestral lands were given to the Czechs. Uh, Slovakia and Ruthenia were torn out of Hungary. And, of course, you lost uh, the Germans lost Danzig and Memel and the Polish corridor and parts of Silesia to Poland. So this is, was an enormous amputation of lands from Hungary, Austria, and Germany uh, to these new nations, basically Poland and Czechoslovakia in the east. And while Hitler agreed that he would not get back the lands in the west, he pretty much ceded them because he didn't want another war in the west. He was determined to get back the lost lands in the east. And it was his desire to get back the Sudetenland from Czechoslovakia for Germany and also the desire to uh, get the return of Danzig, which was a small town, German town of 350,000, to put a, a German flag over it again. That was the cause of World War II. And the British had no vital interest in whose flag flew over Danzig, none whatsoever. Indeed, they thought the German claim was strongest to Danzig because it was an entirely German city, 95% German. It had a Nazi legislature. They were all voting Nazi there. There were enormously enthusiastic Nazis in uh, Danzig. And so the British gave a war guarantee to Poland that it would back it up whatever stance it took against the Germans in these negotiations, and the Poles decided not to negotiate. 